Yeah, Lagos Talks 91.3. Let's talk. Introducing to you our guest today on State of the Nation, Pastor Itua Igodalo. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Welcome. Thank you. All right. So, a few days ago, you convened uh, a gathering of uh, like minds, which uh, was Africa Leadership Group in conjunction with a uh, Nigeria Leadership Series. And it was a press conference exactly to talk about the state of the nation. And a lot of issues were brought to the fore. Questions were asked by journalists. And uh, that clip that we played before we came on air was part of what you said on that day. What moved you to convene that gathering? Well, um, people have asked me this question before. They say, why all of a sudden you are here, there, everywhere? <laughs> the truth of the matter is that um, I've always been this way inclined. This is not the first press conference I'm calling. Uh, for years and years, I've been really talking about Nigeria and things like that. I think what has generated this new passion is, this, is the interview I had with Arise just before my 60th birthday. A totally unsolicited interview. I think they wanted to talk to me about my 60th birthday and the conversation went into that direction. And um, since then, there have been a lot of call for clarity of what I really am thinking, what I want. All I want is a good Nigeria. A good Nigeria where everybody has a chance. A good Nigeria where our resources are made available to the people. A good Nigeria where people are not hijacking the future of Nigeria and so on and so forth. And this is really what is the thinking behind that particular press conference just to clarify issues and so that people understand exactly what we're coming what we're all about okay so um we we, we had a very robust conversation with uh, some other people uh, who you invited some people joined via zoom and what we got is exactly what is in the minds of quite a number of Nigerians. I don't know about everybody, but I know that majority of Nigerians think that we are in a very bad place. What comes to your mind when you think about the situation in which we have found ourselves? You know, um, Nigeria has a lot of potential because we have enormous, enormous resource and enormous human capital. A situation where 12 million Nigerian children are out of school a situation where people are killed in different parts of Nigeria, both in the north and in the east and the southeast. The, a situation where people are afraid to move out of their stations in Nigeria. A situation where the Naira keeps depreciating almost on a daily basis. Uh, and a situation where the health facilities are really, really poor and people are becoming hopeless. And for the first time in my life, people are now offering dual citizenship or different passports as a business. Hmm. You know, uh, somebody had the temerity to come to me and offer me uh, to buy some foreign passport as a business. And I asked the person, why are you doing this business? He says, because they don't think there's any hope in Nigeria. So people are making money from thinking that when there is a crisis, they can run out of Nigeria. And that has shown me really how very, very dire we are. You know, we lose staff almost on a daily basis to Canada, to Australia, to Dubai, to London, to U.S. Every day, the best minds, some of the best minds and best brains of Nigeria are being exported or exporting themselves. Children are going to school abroad and they're refusing to come back uh, because they just don't feel that Nigeria portends any uh, hope for them. Corruption has become a culture, a deep culture, that anyone who even tries to not to be corrupt is vilified, mm. even in the private sector, not even just in government, even in the private sector. People are stealing from their bosses in private, making deals of Dizu, making deals of Nepa, making deals, even in the church, even in the church. People are uh, loading invoices and things like that and making small, small money everywhere. So the truth has lost its value. Uh, and it's become so bad that if you try to tell the truth within a group, they vilify you, mm. they victimize you, they set you up, 
and they make you look like the bad person. So the truth has become wrong the in truth, the manner of speaking. The truth has become wrong. Hard work has become almost uh, irrelevant and unnecessary because people feel that, well, just follow a big man, be a psychophant, do a contract, do this, do that, and make money easy. So the values that make a nation great, the values on which we were originally brought up, totally eroded. And the children are this, they don't know left from right, right from wrong, good hmm. from bad. You know, uh, certain courses have been taken out of our curriculum, history, uh, civics, morality, moral values. You are paying teachers to write exams for children. They have uh, exam centers now all over the place. Teachers would rather sell their, sell their lecture notes than teach the children. I mean, uh, women in school are being uh, uh, asked for sex so that before they can pass the exams, people have been victimized all over the place. Mm. And there seems to be nobody that you can complain to, nobody you can report to, people being kidnapped almost on a daily basis everywhere. Uh, I don't think in a long time we've had it uh, in such a situation in, in Nigeria. Uh, especially security-wise and uh, in terms of the economy. Exactly. And I think a lot of Nigerians are really beginning to be a bit pushed to the wall. Exactly. And if you recall uh, on on that day, which was uh, last Saturday to be precise, uh, amidst all the questions, I was very particular. I knew that I wanted to ask only one question. And then I asked you, the level of insecurity as alarming as it is, what do you think could be done and then i remember your answer and i would very much love you to rehash it you said in your own words that part of what you said was that the president knows what to do well you know um everything rises and falls on leadership and um i'm a leader i run a church i run a, an accounting practice uh, my word is almost law in that place what i want done is what gets done and what I focus on is what people help me to focus on, okay? Um, I think Nigeria has enough uh, uh, energy in terms of knowledge of security. We have enough uh, people in the armed forces, okay? I think what they're looking for is directive, a very strong directive, and looking also at body language and so on and so forth, and instruction as to what to do. And I think for one reason or the other, our president hasn't quite emphatically given that sort of directive. And I'm asking him, I'm just wishing and hoping that he would, uh, so that we can get a sense of really where we are going, you know, and so on and so forth. And that is why it came out like that, that day that, well, I do believe that His Excellency knows exactly what to do. And I'm hoping now, I'm hoping that he will do it. Give his people instruction. The IG of police, I give you 24 hours to do this, that, and the other. But such instructions have been given before and blatantly disobeyed. Because they can get away with it. Mm. If you disobey me, I fire you. You know, Obama, Obama told his SEALs, go get me Osama bin Laden. Go get me Osama bin Laden. They know they cannot disobey. If you disobey me, IG, if you don't get me this thing within the next 48 hours... Don't come to this. I, I had a, sh a mix-up kind of when I was trying to design uh, an e-flyer and I addressed you as Ed Pastor and someone said, ah, he might not like it all. That he's not usually used to those kind of things. I used to maybe Pastor. And I said, okay, I'm going to clear that so that for next time, I won't even have to ask again. <laughs> what's, what's the position? Well, I'm Pastor in charge or Senior Pastor of Trinity House. Trinity and House. And it's Church. as simple as that. So, head pastor, senior pastor, it's okay. It's all the same. It's all right. Same. I just wanted to know. Yeah. All right. So, like I told you, um, on a normal day, I have um, uh, people we call the usual suspects. They're my regular analysts on the show. They come in and then we look at all the stories. And last week, I was getting ready for the show. And at the point, I asked myself if I really wanted to do it because I saw. 25 developing stories, all stories about insecurity, violence, killings, murder everywhere. And I felt very tired. Now today, 
it's basically the same thing. Looking at the, this headline, this one is on the Premium Times, which you can see on the screen. It says, panic has bandits threatening to kill 17 kidnapped Nigerian students tomorrow. That's one. We are seeing this is corruption related. It says 316 duplicated projects worth 39.5 billion naira in 2021 budget. And then a senator is saying that Boko Haram is regrouping in the Northeast. And the details are very, very scary. And these are the things we get to see every day. Now the presidency is saying. Uh, that there's there's a plot to pass a vote of no confidence on uh, Mr. President. Do <laughs> have we gotten to that stage or not? In your own opinion. Well, I don't even think there's any value in there being a plot to pass a vote of no confidence in uh, Mr. President. But usually, this is what generally happens. Any time people start to comment about the state of the nation. The next thing is that you get some kind of uh, uh, all sorts of manners of uh, vilification, presidency denial, everything is a plot to unseat the government, everything is a plot to do this, everything is a plot to do that, and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is that nobody is plotting anything. Hmm. You understand? People are just not satisfied, and they're just not happy. And they're just making their opinions known. Um, um, there's nobody, there's nothing anybody will gain by plotting to unseat anybody. All everybody wants is, please let us have good governance, okay? Who will be plotting to unseat Buari? Eh? The only person that will benefit from it, because the constitution is clear, you understand? If the, you can't hijack a presidency, you can impeach a president, the next in command becomes president, and so on and so forth. So who is plotting to do that? That's a, that must be purely political. And a lot of the political people will wait for the end of the term and then come up with their own political destiny to win the elections. Fortunately, President Buhari is not uh, contesting again in again, 2023. Yes. So why is anybody wasting their time to, to plot or do anything? So this is always what we get. Eh? My appeal and my strong appeal to our rulers across the board is for them to please listen to the citizenry. Good, bad, or ugly comments. Eh? Tackle each person's comments. Deal with the people who have spoken. Hear from them what they are saying. And then, first of all, give an assurance if they agree with what the people are saying, that you people are really crying, you know. Uh, The guy who hasn't eaten, hasn't eaten. There's nothing you can do about it. The person whose child has been kidnapped, the child has been kidnapped. The person who, 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 who... whose child is not going to school. The child is not going to school. Uh, Their issue is not plotting against anybody. Their issue is, please try and ensure that, first of all, I'm not kidnapped. And if I'm kidnapped, try and ensure that there's an apparatus to rescue me. You know, the child who, the people who spend three, six hours going from Lagos to Ibadan on the expressway, their problem is that they spend six hours on the expressway. Not the, 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 not the, the, the area boy. His problem is that he's, he's sleeping under the bridge. And we need to approach, we need to focus on each of these problems and find a way to solve them. This is what government is supposed to do, to make life tolerable, livable, and, if possible, pleasurable for its citizens. That's the role of government. True. And that's what government should focus on. How do we make life better for the generality of Nigerians? Mm. It may not be possible to satisfy everyone, but we can motivate them in a certain direction. And we're not even asking government to provide all the money. Government can motivate its citizens and get them into action. You know what? This is your street. Let us all clean it up. Come out. Let's clean it together. These potholes, we can fix them together. That's what they call PPP arrangements. That's what they call foreign in, uh, foreign investments. That's what they call uh, private investments into certain things. But government, by their role... Has to drive those things. Has to drive those things. Mm. Fantastic. And then a lot of people think that 
aside all these problems that we have in Nigeria, some of them look kind of peculiar because when you go to most countries, maybe not all, even African countries who are deemed smaller than us, the most of these basic things do work. And then people now say, oh, these are problems that can be addressed, just like you said. But there are other things that must be put in place first because of, in quote, our peculiar problems, part of which is the constitutional review that people have been pushing for. To what extent do you think that would help solve these problems? To a large extent. You know, Nigeria's problem did not start with Buhari or Jonathan or even Obasanjo in his first term. Nigeria's problems had been inherent in the structuring of Nigeria since 1914. The bringing together of three, four, five, two hundred different tribes without the person who brought them together, giving them a commonality of purpose and vision and a benefit of them all coming together. The British just mashed us together and said, manage yourselves, Mm. okay? When we were discussing independence, the three regions came together and agreed on independence under certain terms. No problem. But those terms were truncated in 1966. So it's like, I agree to come to live in your house and sleep in the guest room. And then all of a sudden in 1966, <laughs> uh, the whole thing, you now say, no, it's, it's, a, it's in your a own bedroom. sitting room and your <laughs> bedroom with your wife, I want to sleep. Of course, you will say this is not our agreement. And if you put a gun to my head and force me, uh, and I force you that I sleep in your bedroom with your wife, and you put a gun to my head, I say, okay, no problem. I'm under duress. I accept that. But I'm not happy. Yes. And at any uh, chance I have, including to steal your gun or kill you or something, I will try and do it because it's not the terms on which we agreed to live together in the same apartment. This is what happened to Nigeria. We agreed on regional governments. We agreed on each region developing at its own pace. Hmm. We agreed on each region developing its own natural resource. We agreed on each region having its own constitution to some extent. We agreed on a revenue sharing formula of everything we developed, some part going to federal, and these are the federal things. And then in 1966, because one of our brothers had the gun, and because this, he rewrote our constitution without mm. consulting us or consulting the people. Which of our brothers? Ironsi, to start off with. Okay. It was Ironsi that started this thing. I don't know who gave him the advice. He came out in 1966 and said he wanted a unitary government, which was in the basis of our constitution. I think he did it to control the nation under somebody's advice. Mm. I don't know who. Okay, and they thought that by bringing Nigeria together as a unitary government, the military could better govern Nigeria. But military governance is an aberration in the first place. So we shouldn't have accepted that coup as Nigerians in the first place. But a lot of us didn't understand, and most we didn't have the courage to face off a coup like they did in Neymar recently yes. when they wanted to overthrow that lady, and the whole nation went into chaos. Okay, but Gowan did it. I'm uh, sorry, uh, what's his name? Iran did it. Uh-huh. He, he started this problem with his unitary this thing, and Gowan continued it. Okay, okay. The only reason you can say that Gowan maybe were in a state of war and uh, blah blah blah, but as soon as the war ended uh, in 1970, he should have returned the country back to the original constitution. But by this time, he had divided the country into 12 states and broken the basis of our marriage. So the wife had committed adultery, fornication, hadn't had babies for other men Mm. and destroyed the basis of the marriage. How do we now refix the marriage? Exactly. Nobody has addressed it till today. Till today. Is there a reason for this? Because as much as we, we can see, everybody seems to have an idea of what has gone wrong. But why is it so difficult for us to just come together and say, okay, let's fix this thing? It's difficult because a lot of the people who have been in governance since 1966 have personally benefited from Mm. this rearrangement of our constitution because they now control personally a lot of resource and take a lot of decisions. And that is where corruption crept in, okay? And they they could do it virtually unchallenged 
okay when you have a situation where you decide by your pen how much revenue comes to federal how much revenue goes to state and how much of that you can take as a person hmm. as an individual uh, call it head of state call it minister of finance call it uh, this governor thing, governor even anything, chairman of local or, or whatever you you can say how much of it comes to you your family and your cronies on a regular basis why would you want to change that law when the president is a petroleum minister or whatever since 1971 or whatever the the presidents have always controlled the petroleum ministry more or less obasanjo did it uh, Buhari is more or less doing it also, so that they decide on where everything goes. You understand? Uh, they do it at federal, they do it at state. All our governors, all our this, they're so powerful. They're so they decide everything. They know where everything goes. So when it benefits them with the way things are. It's very difficult. It takes a lot of discipline. In fact, they might even exact more energy and put in more resources to to sustain the current system, so that uh, the, the world that keeps coming to them keeps accruing it more. It takes a lot of discipline. You're a senator. You are earning. They say it's not up to thirty million or forty million a month. Blah 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 blah. Is it? Are you going to change that law? Hmm. It's tough. So what is missing in Nigeria is the selfless people. The determined people, the honest people, the sincere people, they're too few because it's not easy. Everybody needs money, even myself. You need money. You need a good That's life. to survive. You need money to survive. But you see, the problem is that some of us don't know when enough is enough. Hmm. And we need to know when enough is enough. So what we need now is a crop of good people, sincere people who know that, you know what, 90% or 80% or 60% of our resource shouldn't end up in individual pockets. That resource should go to help the generality of the people. Not that 20% or 10% of our population should take 90% of our resource. And most of that resource, they don't do anything with it. Most of it has gone into houses abroad, in bank accounts in Nigeria, some are being buried in ceilings and lofts and things like that. They're just there in the man's imagination. Yet people can go to school. The issue is, is it fair? Mm. It's not fair. You know, in fact, my surprise, to be honest, is that anything gets done in Nigeria. Anything. Anything. I'm surprised that we still build a few roads. I'm surprised that we still build a few bridges. And that's what gives me hope, you know, because there's still a modicum of conscience. That instead of just taking the money, at least they say, you know what, I will build a road with 10, 20, 30 percent of the money and I will take 70. <laughs> so there's still some conscience. Is that conscience now that I am appealing to hmm. and I'm saying to who I call the gatekeepers of Nigeria, this is enough. You've made a lot of money and you are misallocating misalloc this money. You are using this money to feed people. When you could use it to develop them, them and so they can feed so themselves, that they can feed themselves, and then they can bring other people up as oh, well. Stop giving it to them in pittances. You take a majority, you give the less to them in pittances, and they eat and they wait for the next pittance, keeping them in poverty deliberately, uh, deliberately so. almost. Mm -hmm. But teach them, give them this money so they can feed themselves and contribute to the economy and contribute to the growth of the country. This is what we're asking for, really. Okay, so if you look at an aggregation of thoughts in recent years over uh, the problems we have in Nigeria, a lot of people have clamored for, in quote again, revolution. It depends on how you see it. Some, when you, they hear that word, violence comes to mind, there's a different school of thought that says there are other different kinds of revolution. How best do we approach if this is an avenue to lead, out, out, lead us out of this problem? Um, a revolution doesn't have to be violent. A revolution simply means a man that has revolved to do things in a different way. Hmm. Okay? So for a long time, we have been tolerating this kind of thing. We've been tolerating the fact that, well, it's not necessary to go to school. If you see school to go, no problem. We tolerate the fact that 1.2 1. 1. million children graduate, uh, sorry, 
come out of secondary school, only about 300,000 can enter university. Okay, uh, you roam the streets. But when everybody now says, you know what, this thing must change. Eh? And we're looking for who can change it. Or asking you that you're in charge to please change it. Then you have the people who are revolved or resolved that things must change. But for a long time, Nigerians didn't quite resolve that things must change. Most of them took it well. That's the way God wants it. Mm. But now they're beginning to realize that, well, uh, God probably doesn't want it this way. It's the way man has made it. So we need to come back and appeal to our leaders. I'm even of this thought that you can't be president of Nigeria, governor of a state, uh, this and that, and you will be poor. It's almost it's, impossible. It's impossible. It's almost impossible. By all human standards. Uh, well, even <laughs> you cannot be president of America, in spite of their saying they are not corrupt, and be poor. When Obama went into America presidency, he hadn't finished paying off his school loan. Within a few years of presidency, somehow somebody paid the school loan more or less for him. He came out of the White House. He was a millionaire. Okay, wrote a couple of books, got on a few boards uh, to talk to, for Obama to talk to you now. It's $250,000, almost a million dollars for him to come and appear in your event. The, you can't do such an important job and you can be poor. It's almost impossible. The issue is don't just corner too much or the resource and don't let your lieutenants, either you're a governor or a local government chairman, corner things that should be for the commonwealth. That's what we're saying. Let what should go to education go to education. What should go to health go to health. What should go to infrastructure go to infrastructure. Don't take it all. And then pay people properly for doing their job. job. Hmm. All right. So maybe we're getting to that time that we need uh, to allow people to weigh in uh, by calling in and sending in their message. But before then, there's this question I just need to ask. A lot of people have already sent it to me since yesterday night. And that is the people in your sector, religious leaders, what is their role? I think a lot of people are quite disappointed with how religious leaders have responded to this, the Nigerian situation. So the question is, what's the way forward? What role should religious leaders play? Uh, to some extent, I won't blame them, the religious leaders. Why so? Because a lot of them don't understand what their role is. Mm. A lot of them misunderstand what their role is. They think that their role is to mind their business. To just pray for the people, teach them scripture, both either Quran or this thing, and that it is uh, an abuse or, or a degradation for a religious leader to descend into the into the valley of politics. Okay, and it's also because, unfortunately, they've given politics a bad connotation. Politics is not bad; it's the way we practice it that is bad. It's like telling me that eating food is bad. But if you eat food all over your face and you mm-hmm. stamp it on the mm-hmm. floor like a bad. literature, <laughs> then it's bad. Okay? Politics simply means the process of accepting or obtaining leadership. Okay? Now it needs a bit of compromise, willing and dealing, uh, talking here and there. But it doesn't have to descend into the depths of murder, slandering, killing, dirty, this and that. But because a few people who are not well-meaning go into the political fray, they want power at any means. And they make it a very frightening and life-threatening and do-or-die affair. It doesn't have to be a do-or-die affair. If you genuinely want to serve people, it's not do-or-die. You're offering yourself for service. If they accept, fine. fine. If they don't they accept, don't. you take a walk. <laughs> and that's what service really should be. But if you are going to steal the people's money and you are going to make a big name for yourself then it becomes do or die yeah. so most of the people in the political arena the motivation is wrong and our our uh, spiritual leaders should know that they are affected by who leads the country not only that they should be the ones guiding those who are going into leadership instructing them uh, teaching them, telling them to fear God, telling them to behave well, and so on and so forth. And you know what? In biblical terms, it was the religious leader who chose or anointed the political leader. Hmm. It was Samuel that chose Saul to be king on instruction from God. Until today, 
even in the so-called democracy. When you are okay, they use the chief judge, but in England, it is the Archbishop of Canterbury that anoints the queen or the king, because that is how it is. The spiritual man hears from God, advises the people, and helps them choose under criteria their leader, and is also there as a check and a caution to the leader, because the leader too needs a pastor. So the pastor will tell the leader, David. But Sheba, you slept with yesterday, you made a mistake. This economic policy you did, hmm. you made a mistake. This uh, 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 Adonijah that wants to be your successor, no. It is a Solomon with wisdom that we want. That is the role of the spiritual or religious leader, to ensure that the uh, political leaders are doing what they should do according to the dictates of God, to encourage as many people as possible to go into political leadership and if they themselves feel inclined and they want to drop their exactly. their their cassock or their turban or whatever and go into the fray then that's that's their own personal as long choice. as they do what is right as long as they do what is right <laughs> but that they will stand back and stand aloof and say that uh, politics is dirty or is politics is demeaning and all that they are shirking their responsibility now should we be partisan and so on and so forth? Uh, that is debatable, okay? Mm -hmm. What it is is you are looking for good leadership. And if you find good leadership in a certain area, you go for it. So, for example, Samuel was the poly, uh, leader of this. When they identified that the leader should come from the tribe of Benjamin, he went for it. Is he now going to be partisan? Mm -hmm. They said it's Benjamin that we want. So he says, okay, we'll go for Benjamin. So if I find a good leader in APC, in Taraba State, I will support him. If I find a good leader in PDP, in Oyo State, I will support him. If I find a good leader in SDP, in Kwara State, I will support him. Anywhere I find a good leader that fits the description of what we're saying, I will support. Okay? But that I will now myself, except if I choose to play a different role, now become a full member of a party. I will not. You will not? I will not. Except I choose to now say I want to offer myself for political office. And that time hasn't come and that thought hasn't been debated. Okay, But for now, my emphasis is finding good leadership anywhere I find anywhere, it. Anywhere, regardless of which state, of, of state, your religion. Regardless of religion, regardless of... Uh, now, Syria Rufa is my good friend. I think to a large extent, administratively, is doing a good job in Kaduna State, okay? He's got falling free into this religious thing and mm. all that, and he's created an image for himself of a religious intolerant person. But uh, to be honest, it's just because the man is a little bit aggressive in the way he handles things. But I'm his friend. I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor, okay? My brother is his friend. He's a Christian, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, I think he's open-minded enough, Okay, listen, but unfortunately, somehow he's really played into those uh, 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 religious jokers. And my advice to him is to find a way to really present himself as he is. Okay, um, uh, Obasek is my good friend, he's in PDP. Uh, 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 Sonwulu is my good friend, he's in APC. What do I care? Uh, Jagaban is my good friend, he's in APC. Uh, the vice president is my good friend. He's in APC, but uh, uh, the Okowa is my good friend. He's in he's in PDP. But as long as they are doing well and they are governing well, I will clap for them. But if they do not, I will tell them mm. that this is not what we agreed. This is not how you should rule this people. Is there is there anybody off the top of your head mm. that you would wish would contest for the presidency? I don't think I should go into that. <laughs> I don't want anybody to take me up on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but to be honest with you, I'm actually going around having discussions with people, oh. asking people, you know, the same question you ask me. I ask a lot of people and I note their answers. Mm -hmm. And they've given me diverse kinds of names and different kinds of people. And I look at them and I weigh them and I understand that. 
But right now, I won't talk about that. But you tell me after the interview. I won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> if you're joining us for the first time or perhaps you don't have the numbers, I'm going to feed the numbers out right now. The numbers are 0809 234 5913, which is also a line for WhatsApp messages. Also 0809 191 3913. 0809 Two 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 oh nine one three and the following landlines oh one five one five oh nine one three and oh one five one five one nine one three. We are on Twitter at Lego Stocks nine one three. Don't forget to use the hashtag SOTN nine one three. All right. If you call in, please make your comments or your questions very very brief, maximum one minute. Lego Stocks. Good evening. Ah, Emmanuel. Good evening. <laughs> Uche. I greet you, sir. Okay, where wow. are you? A papa, I guess. I'm in a papa today. All right, Pastor. Okay. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Uche. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, well, today is a very big one. Mm. I've listened to you, sir, and most of the things you send are quite valid and straight to the point. But, sir, you see, my problem, you know, some of us have actually lost faith in this present administration. For me, if a man has eight hours to complete a journey to a destination. And he has spent six hours going backwards steadily. It would be very wrong for anybody to think that that person can make any forward movement. That's that's the state. That's the statement of fact. So my worry is that 2023 is still a long way from today. Practically two years. With the way Nigeria is at the moment, I have my fears. I have my fears. The present leadership has shown that it is non-existent. And another worrying thing, Pastor, is that even beyond 2023, look at the names that have been bandied around that want to come into power and take over. None of them engenders hope. The question is, at what point will Nigeria be rescued? Because from what we see, both now and in the near future, it doesn't look like there's any hope for this country. Hmm. And that's the worrying part, right. part for me. Thank you. Thank Jay. you. Thank you very much. So we'll take as many as we can and take the comments before you now make your submissions. Lego Stocks, good evening. Hello, good evening. Good evening. My, my name is Val. My name is Val. I'm calling from First Act. All right, quickly, Val. Pastor, good evening, sir. The, the, the question I want to ask, uh, you're doing a great job, uh, first of all. Um, do you think it will be wise for us to look out for leaders within the age bracket of 50 and maybe early 60s, instead of focusing on um, people who fall within the range of middle 60s and upwards? We should change our mindset and bring people younger, very vibrant, into the political system and leadership. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Lego Stocks, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How did you become the line? Good evening, Pastor. Good evening. How are you? It's very, very, very fine, sir. It's emotional and a very, very emotional time hearing you. Like the voice not to play. I hope you are the one that gave the very exactly. was wonderful. Yes. Thank yes. you very much. Sir, so, because looking at what is playing out, from the 1914 till now, I see feedback not being used to better the lot of the country. Because the essence of feedback is for you to work with it and, you know, give out your best. Yes, but what you see is defense, defending whatever thing they are doing. Like you said, it's happening in the business place, you do get. But there is this language that says, being considerate, then take a chances to better the lot of people. If you are taking chances, take it for the good of your subordinate or you know, for future preferences. 50 years time, all the money will acquire, you won't use it, it will be devalued, it won't be taken anyway. How do we inculcate this into the generation, to our leaders, to our upcoming ones? Because the, 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 the effect and what they are saying, it seems as if we just pass negative things to the younger ones and they are teaching it. How do you change this narrative, honestly? Like Mr. Uche is talking about, seems as there is no social, I believe there is social, but how do you pass this message so that we understand the language being considered, compassionate? All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Now let me t- take a few messages because we're actually running out of time very fast. Oi from Finland says, I agree with Pastor that we need a futuristic leader, but the truth is that the political cabals in conjunction with economic and religious cabals have produced a population of illiterate, low-minded individuals and underdeveloped citizens who don't even know what good leadership is. The system they have created has made it almost impossible for a futuristic leader to be the president. 
brilliant minds like Kingsley Mogalu were never voted for because of the failed system. All right. Um, Oluwa Sheon says, Emmanuel, remember my call several editions ago. The insecurity and other vices we have today are a matter of quest for easy money. The values you grew up with are up in the air and all poofed. Just imagine an 18 year old seeking to use iPhone 12, drive a nice car, and turn up in the clubs. Huge. Me, I want to ask, where's the church in asking for accountability in the funds people bring to the altar? Uh, okay. Um, Bao from Ikrodu says, The problem, sir, is not that they do not know their role, it's that on top of not knowing their role, they've co- colluded with our killers. They lay hands on them, they make them deacons. No reprimands, nothing. Let me rephrase the question. When will the church realize that they are the conscience of the nation? I'm tired of the capitalist religion, the Pentecostal church pedals. Okay, one more message from WhatsApp. Kowalanski from Delta says, Since 1960 till date, successive governments have left the country worse than the Metit. Isn't that enough to make us know the problem of Nigeria is beyond presidency? Buhari will leave and the problems will remain maybe take a different dimension. Let's stop looking at the rotten fruit and start probing or interrogating the rotten tree. All right. Ogunleye uh, Temitokwe on Twitter says, the pastor has not really said anything with regards to the solution. Are we to go back to the old constitution or still continue with prayers? I think he addressed that pretty much. Jay Olayinka says, our religious leaders need to understand that even Jesus, our Savior, spoke truth to power to the political leaders of his day, especially the Pharisees. He practically stuck his thumb in their faces and railed against their corruption. All right, sir. Just one or two more calls very quickly. Lagos Talks, good evening. Hello. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening, sir. Yes, good evening. Uh, pa- uh, pastor, pastor, good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, yeah. Pastor, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Keep it on. Keep saying the truth you know. Hmm. Don't deviate from there. Anytime you deviate from the truth, you know you have fair crack that said you. I want you to make it. Anytime you will say it, make sure you stand on the truth. Say it the way you teach. No matter if anybody can feel it, whatever anybody, it don't, doesn't matter. The, the, the most matters you have to do what was sent you to, to, to do. The thing is that until Nigerians have a change of heart, we are so weird. How can you, because of somebody win the election, you so much hate the man, so, so much hate so much anger. If you get to form all the world, you get to hype up in the world, you call the state, Niger Delta, you get right. to grow five planets in the water to cripple the economy. All right. So I need to I need to let you go. Thank you for your call. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're virtually out of time. So I I'd like you to quickly summarize everything if I, that's possible. I, thank you. Nigerians uh, are in pain. But what I'm saying to Nigerians, first of all, just to summarize, is that stop complaining, stop talking, stop gisting, stop uh, belly aching, start doing something. There's something everybody can do. Uh, previously, a lot of us were ignorant. We didn't know what was going on. Now you know. It, it's out there. So you do something about it. Uh, right now, the only constitutional way to change a government is to vote. And the voting is coming up in two years' time. So make sure that you make sure that INEC allows you to vote. Hmm. So we must challenge INEC. And we must make sure INEC doesn't give us nonsense. We must make sure that INEC does what is right. We must make sure that INEC is not part of this corruption and doesn't allow the politicians to bribe them or force them or coerce them into doing the wrong things. So INEC, wake up and do the right thing. Okay, register people to vote and register them to vote in places where on voting day they can go and vote and make sure that you put in place uh, things to ensure that votes are not changed, votes are not, vote boxes are not stolen or whatever it is. So you all go and register to vote. Number two, go and inform as many people as you can that they too must get involved in this process and register to vote and talk to people along their roads and 
along their streets and in their areas of influence. Number three, get involved in the political process, okay? Until they give independent candidacy, you have to join or form a political party. So join one of the political parties or form one of your own. If you join the political party, become relevant. Be there in the kitchen where they are taking the decisions. It's not after they've done their primaries. They now give you some kind of candidate that you don't want, that you start complaining. Go there and be part of the delegates and be part of the people who are selecting people who will come out. Everybody must get involved. And then number four, everybody should speak up also. If there's something you don't like that government is doing, be bold enough to say it, okay? It's a great risk in Nigeria where you have government that's very sensitive and thinks that everything mm. you say is something anti-government, <laughs> you want to bring government down. But uh, we have to take the risk. Uh, some people need to take the risk. And maybe if enough of you actually speak up on specific things, not general complaints, maybe government will, will react. Okay, And I think that will basically answer almost all the questions that people have asked. Okay, At what point will Nigeria be rescued? At the point where you all get involved and begin to say, no more, enough is enough, let's do things properly. At when you insist that there must be a constitutional reform or review and have a constitution that will work. Uh, for Val, leaders 50, 60, my problem is not age. My problem is competence, wisdom, ability, and so on and so forth. Uh, Joe Biden is 80-something almost, or 78 or so. He's a good leader. He's doing his best. As long as the leader has strength and capacity, mm. he's not the age we're concerned about. Although, naturally, you think that a younger person should be able to walk harder and run faster and so on and so forth. But then the age, older people also have experience and wisdom. So I don't really care about the age of the person. I care about the competence, the strength, and the ability to, to, do, to do things, okay? Um, yeah, we keep talking to leaders so that they understand our feedback. Uh, political cabals, that's why I said get involved. Get involved in the party and be a signpost for change and make sure your values are there. Temitoko uh, Ogunleye, she's my daughter. I'm mm -hmm. glad to hear from her, and I want her to know I'm looking for her, so come and see me. Uh, we need to go back to the old constitution of Nigeria, or an amended version thereof, because that's the basis on which we agreed to work together. But you either force, if you can, or cajole, or beg the present government to change the constitution, or you look for a government that will ensure that there's a change in constitution. The option uh, is yours. Um, I will keep on trying to say the truth. It's a great risk to one's life in this Nigeria. Uh, but, uh, you know, I have two people to answer to when I die. Uh, maybe three. My late wife, who is expecting me to make something of my life. Uh, she sacrificed herself for this whole thing. Uh, my mother, who was a great Nigerian, very, very strict, and who will be very uh, uh, ashamed of me if I die and meet her in heaven, and she says, see what I left Nigeria, how I allowed Nigeria. Because she was very vocal all her life and really prayed, fasted, and spoke out in Nigeria. And of course, the God, Lord Almighty, who created me and who gave me a certain capacity, vision, and purpose in life. And I must try and make sure that I fulfill that purpose. And one of those purposes is to make Nigeria great again. Not just Nigeria, Africa and the African and I'm really, really interested in Africa and the Africans because a lot of us Africans tend to have the same kind of problem. So if it is spiritual, I am praying. If it is uh, intelligence or hard work, I am working very hard. If it is political or leadership-wise, I am speaking to people. I'm talking to people. I'm engaging everybody. I have nothing personal against anybody, but I am determined that by God's grace, there will be a process that will bring forth good leadership, great leadership in this country. Nigeria deserves it. Mm. Thank you very much. And enough time to just squeeze in one last question. For You've advised us to, to participate in politics by going out to vote and all of that. What do you think are the main qualities to look for in a good leader, particularly somebody to lead Nigeria? What are the qualities we should look out for? I will state them. And that was one of the very first posts that I gave out, okay? A leader is somebody that shows direction, that leads by example, and that gives hope and encouragement and puts in structures 
and policies in place to make sure that everybody is happy. Sheikh Al Maktoum says a leader's job is to make his people happy. So number one, a leader must fear God. A leader must fear God. That is what speaks to the leader's conscience. Number two, a leader must be visionary. Visionary. He must know where he's going and where he's taking the people. Number three, a leader must be honest and forthright. Honest, forthright, and very, very sincere. Number four, a leader must be compassionate and care about the people that is leading. That's why David says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is compassionate concerning me. A leader must not be offhand and indifferent to the people he or she is leading. A leader must be hardworking because it takes a lot of hard work, a lot of hard work to put together an unwieldy set of people. You must also be a 20, you must be almost a 24 hour our person okay and um, a leader must be very very forthright and knowledgeable knowledgeable you want somebody who is exposed who who knows things who understands things you don't need to know everything but you should have the ability to know good from bad right from wrong and a leader must have wisdom that's why solomon prayed for wisdom when he was given the opportunity to lead says god give me wisdom so I may know right from wrong and lead your people aright. So if a leader has these basic qualities, okay, uh, he may have weaknesses here and there. No problem about mm. that. We will we'll accept some of those weaknesses or find people who will cover up for those weaknesses or point those weaknesses out to him. Nobody is perfect, yes. but at least you have the fundamentals to begin to lift up a nation out of wherever they are, or even your family. And it's not just for a nation, it's for families, for tribes, for groupings, it's for corporate organizations, and so on and so forth. But we have not just really in Nigeria been blessed with, with enough leaders of this kind of capacity. All right. <sighs> Well, thank you very much, Pastor, for coming in. I wish uh, we could go on and on, but of course, these things have uh, limitations, which is, of course, time. And I'm hoping that uh, anytime soon when we call you again, you oblige us. And uh, apologies to all the people who have sent in so many messages and the phone lines keep uh, blinking, but uh, we have to go. Once again, Pastor, thank you very much. It's been a day on this special edition of States of the Nation. We'll be back by the grace of God next Tuesday at 5 p.m. to do what we do. Let me ask you again. Do you know who your neighbor is? Lagos Talks 91.3. Let's talk.